Hi, everyone. Have you ever wondered why do we value one good over another? Why do we value a brand new pair of jeans more than one that you can find on Vinted? Why did we value so much our dearest teddy bear when we were young, even when they had holes and a terrible smell? The question of value, of values, is a fundamental question. It is what guides our choices, but also our economy. And coming from the same business school as most of you in this room, the question of how do we define our goods and services around us and their value is a question I started asking myself six years ago. And one day, I decided to go and meet entrepreneurs that see value in things that have no value in the eyes of anyone else. For 10 months, in 10 different countries, I met more than 100 of them. And I realized one thing. The value that we give to the things around us is purely in our heads. Yes, that dear, smelly, deadly boy that you had when you were a kid had no value in the eyes of anyone else except from you. But you gave it a positive and emotional image. And you know what? The value system in our economy is the same. It is relative to the perception we have of our goods and services. And among all our goods and services, we have created some that have no value by essence. <clears throat> and those is what we call waste. Or as the Cambridge Dictionary tells us, <clears throat> an unwanted matter or materials of any type, especially after useful substances or parts have been removed. Tim Brown, the CEO of a lead design agency, said that waste is a lack of imagination. And indeed, we think that matter or materials have no more use in this world just because we can't think of how they could, what they could become or how they could be useful for another person. But if we, if we keep lacking imagination, it is $4.5 trillion worth of matters and material that we will have wasted from now to 2030. $4.5 trillion. It is 12 times Amazon global revenue, almost twice the French GDP. So if I'm here today, it's because we need change. And if I'm especially here today in this business school, it's because we need change in our economy. Since the Industrial Revolution, we have created a linear economy. We take resources from the Earth, we transform and consume them, and then we throw them away, sometimes directly into the environment. And the value in this linear economy follows a power machine. In the ascendant slope, Value is added at each step, from resource extraction to manufacturing until retail. Value stops increasing once the goods are purchased. And then, drama starts. All the created value so far gets destroyed through landfill or incineration. When I realized this, I was at your seat. Well, not exactly. I was a private equity intern in the seat of one of these towers at the heart of our value-oriented economy. And I realized how paradoxical our system was. Please tell me, how did we manage to create an economic and perennial system that destroys half of the value we create? $4.5 trillion. That is just crazy. But more than being crazy, the system has two main limits. I realized the first one when I was in Indonesia. There, a friend of mine called Yasser told me one day, Gaetan, I want to bring you to one place. I can't tell you more, but you won't regret it. I can't tell you more, but you won't regret it? Nice. In my head, I was thinking about this kind of place. It's not really what happened. So Yasser drove me to Denpasar, one of the major cities in Indonesia. 
It was warm at that time, our windows were open, sunglasses on the head, you can imagine. But then I started to smell, a terrible smell. In fact, yes, I wanted me to see from my own eyes the heart of the problem of our economy. So he drove me to a place called Suwung, a landfill in the heart of the city. And I remember we were driving in this landfill and we saw hills and hills of waste, with really this feeling that this landscape had no end. And for good reason. This landfill was 15 to 25 meters high, on a surface equivalent to 44, 45 football fields. And as you can imagine, this landfill had been in overcapacity for years. The waste was still coming in. With a linear economy, we have created an open type of waste that we now struggle to close. I became aware of the second limit of our system a bit later while traveling. When I was in India, I wanted to see a solution that recovered waste in remote villages. So one day, I decided to take my bag, take an overnight train from New Delhi to Lucknow, and a bus of hours to go to one of these villages. And the image of this little girl pumping water from the ground with her mother telling her to take it with parsimony just hit me. And you know what? The first time I thought about this little girl again was when I was back in France. It was summertime, it was warm, I was at the train station, and I wanted to fill my water bottle. And you know what? It was impossible. The only way to access water in this, pub in this public place was to buy it in a plastic bottle. So while access to water is one of the most basic needs a developing country tries to answer, a developed system made its success conditionary to the use of more resources such as plastic. And this consumerist model led us to the point where we now need 1.7 planet to provide all the resources we need for our linear economy. And this amount have been growing for years, except from one, 2020, COVID crisis peak. And this special year shows us that with a linear economy, the only way to ease the pressure on our resources is to stop our economy. So two main issues in our system, waste and resource scarcity. But now let's take a break. I want to bring you to one of my favorite places on Earth. And for this, I want you to close your eyes. Come on, don't worry, nothing will happen. OK, now take a deep breath in. I want to hear you. And deep breath out. And now imagine. You're in the heart of the rainforest in Costa Rica, the ground field of more than 1,000 species. You've been hiking since early morning. It's now 12, and you've reached a peak. And now you take a moment to observe. And what do you see? You can open your eyes. Everything but waste. Everything but a matter that is not useful. Everything but a material that won't have a second life in this ecosystem. What nature tells us is that waste doesn't exist. Waste is a pure creation of the human mind. Waste is an neural design that we created with a linear system. And what nature tells us is that a model where every element has value is feasible, and it's just in front of us. So let's be creative and change the way we see our resources. Five years ago, when I met this journey meeting entrepreneurs, I discovered a system that transposes the model of our nature into our economy. And this model is the circular economy. 
our production and consumption model that aims to eliminate the production of waste and optimize our resources. In the, cir uh, in the circular economy, the value pyramid becomes circle that retains the value we create. When I was in the US, I met this guy on the right, Nicholas Flanders. Stylish glasses, you say, right? I really wanted to meet Nicholas Flanders because when he starts, he started pitch, he starts saying, I love carbon. And it intrigued me so much because carbon is probably the most hated and rejected type of waste on Earth. But when I met Nicholas, he told me that the idea came out while inquiring about climate change. He said that while everyone agrees on the fact that we need to reduce our carbon emission, we're far from there yet. So he decided to gather a team of researchers and look at what they could do with carbon. And they created a catalyzer called 12 that transforms any carbon dioxide emissions into valuable fuels and chemicals for the industry. So through this innovation, Nicolas Lander showed that by changing the way we perceive our resources, even the most rejected and hated type of waste can become a valuable resource. But while recycling CO2 emissions is a good start, I think we can go even further by eliminating waste from the source. And for this, I went up the value chain to the heart of our problems, but also of our solution, design. And I went in Zurich, in Switzerland, to see these two genius, incredible men and brothers and designers, Marcus and Daniel. Marcus and Daniel wanted to create a collection of clothes that literally imitates a natural cycle. So they created the first collection of clothes that is 100% biodegradable and that goes from cradle to cradle. So after using your clothes, you, your clothes can become a nutritious compost and give back to nature what it gave to produce these pieces. So 12 and fabric illustrate that changing the way we perceive and give value to our resources is beneficial for our economy and our environment. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation has shown that by adopting circular economy principles, Europe could generate a net benefit of $1.8 trillion by 2030. It is twice more than with our linear current development path. And you know what the common point between Seb, Michelin, or Decathlon? These three big companies, among others, have understood the high economic potential of the circular economy, and they adopted it in their core strategy. These three companies are far from being perfect yet in terms of environmental impact. We have to encourage them through solutions such as Phoenix that, re that creates value out of food waste and raised 15 million euros in 2018, or that transforms business model from selling model to a rental or a second-hand one, or even Loop that really tries to develop the deposit scheme in packaging industry or the food industry. And what all of these companies tell us is that whether you will work in a small or a large company, in finance or in marketing, in France or abroad, the circular economy is an incredible potential that would drive sustainable development and create amazing jobs. And honestly, today, if I had to go back to your seat, I would really invest in this new economy. Because like Nicolas, Daniel or Marcus, you can become an actor towards a model where waste doesn't exist anymore, but only resources in the wrong place. Thank you.